Thomas, thank you for coming on, my friend. Thank you for having me. Anytime. I think it'd be remiss of me not to mention The Bachelor and start there because that's where most people know you from. But I'm interested in it from a personal growth perspective. Like, are there any differences between the version of you today and the pre-Bachelor version of Thomas? That's a really good question. I think so. Um, interestingly enough, when I was approached to go on The Bachelor, I saw it as a great opportunity for me to um, have some visibility that then would help me with you know business and impacting people. Um, and then when I went on the show, I realized, holy moly, like there's actually a really good chance for me to find the potential one. Um, and during the show, I then realized that uh, again, this was like the ultimate test for me to um, go past some limiting beliefs that I had. And so to cut a long story short, yes, I ended up like choosing someone, but I also realized that in a personal growth perspective, I chose the unhealed part of myself. So I ended up choosing a person who uh, is fantastic and beautiful, but in the long run, we weren't compatible. And I chose her because I was scared of being rejected from the other person. Um, a part of me wanted the easy life and didn't really want to do the work um, that is needed in, in a relationship for growth. And so at the time I wasn't really aware, but now I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, it's so evident. And so if I hadn't made that choice, I wouldn't have grown as a man. Right. So yeah. building that awareness, was that after you guys broke up when you were able to look at that and go, oh, I've been attracted to someone to heal those unhealed parts of myself. And did you find that heal healing? Yes. Yeah. It's funny enough, like I felt my, my girl was giving me messages beforehand. I just didn't listen to it. And then afterwards, uh, it was, it was, it became louder and louder. And now looking back, I can, I can really, really see why I made that choice. And uh, I then actively did some work to heal those part of myself. And you mentioned that there was obviously a business side of it for you, but also the love aspect as well. Do you think that was a common theme amongst most of the contestants where they go on there for a bit of visibility as well as finding love? I think so. I think it's, um, um, I mean, it's definitely one opportunity that you have maybe one, one in a lifetime to be seen on, on national TV. And, you know, uh, lots of people will leverage it for exposure, for business purposes, or even for the famous, you know, blue tick on Instagram, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which now you can just buy. <laughs> so it's not that relevant anymore. I wonder if Bachelor contestants have dropped now that you can just buy the blue tick. You only get the authentic ones now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and did you get a sense when girls were there for fame or they were there to actually find love? Absolutely. Yeah, there were definitely a couple. You can sense it right away. But on my season, um, I actually felt that most of the girls were there for the right reasons. Yeah. And when you actually go in that scenario and you get to meet the girls and you get to know their story, you feel this sense of almost responsibility. So like, okay, we're not here to F spiders. We're actually here for the, for the, for, for the fair real reason. Um, and you don't want to mess with the girls' hearts because obviously um, you, you get hurt. And so it's, it's a real deal. Were you happy ultimately with how you were portrayed on the show? Yeah, I was, I was, I was very happy. Like I, it was, funnily enough, um, there were a few instances where I didn't get much airtime because I don't do gossip and I don't do drama. And as you can imagine, like, you know, reality TV is all about the drama. Mm. And so whenever there was drama, I would be like out of it. And the girls in my, uh, in my group are also no drama. Um, and so, yes, I think that I came across really authentically. Um, there were, there were a few instances where, and I mean, you must probably can relate to this, obviously being in, on TV for a long time. Um, whenever I would go into a situation, I was very aware of the microphones and the cameras. And so I would almost sometimes question myself in terms of what I was going to say. I wasn't like direct and myself completely. Right. So now if I was to do, that, to, do the, to do anything like this again, I would potentially just trust myself more, be less in my head, more in my heart and just go with the flow. Yeah. And that, that's a skill you have to develop through experience, right? Yeah. So you're in front of the camera every day? Every day. And did you notice a shift in that in your skills in front of the camera by just having to show up in front of it every day? Yeah. So the first time, for example, the first night we had this live interview with the project and I was shitting myself. Like I was literally shitting bricks. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at the, I look at the, the, um, the interview and I, just, I, I can just see a scared version of myself, all analytical, all in my head. 
And then from that day onwards, obviously uh, you go in with a lot more confidence and, you know, no matter what questions they throw you, like you're prepared. So massive shift from the beginning to the end. I mean, that's amazing. And do you feel like that flowed in, has flowed into your content these days with everything you do? I do. Mm. Yeah, it definitely really helped a lot. It's a real accelerator just to get experience and comfortability in front of the camera. Yeah. How much of the show is real and how much is fake? Funnily enough, I actually thought that most of it was going to be fake, but um, having lived it, I would say that um, 85% of it is really real and 15% is not fake, but it's potentially just staged a little bit by the producers in the sense that, for example, I could come on you know, a date with a girl, for example, and I really want to connect with her in other ways, but the producers know that, you know, they need to cause some drama. So they might tell me, Thomas, go in this date and focus a lot on marriage or focus a lot on kids. When I'm like, I've just met this girl. I don't want to talk about kids on the first date in in my first 20 minutes. And they're stirring the pot a little bit. Yeah. And you have to do that. So that's where the, the, I guess the stage comes in. Could you get a sense that the producers were maybe a little bit disappointed if they weren't getting what they wanted? And oh, did yeah. that impact how you were showing up? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. There were, so there were you know, some, some episodes where you interact with someone and you say a certain thing and then they say to you, okay, Thomas, go back and change the way you said this because if, you, if we show this on national TV, you're going to look like a dickhead, for example. And I was oh, like, okay. really? But that was my authentic self. Does it really matter? We're here for business, TV, go and change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, did that take some adjustment, getting used to that? Yeah, a little bit. But, um, but the, the cool thing, though, is that once you let them know exactly who you're interested in, girls, obviously, those girls become untouchable. And then the, the, the main focus is for you to build a relationship and romance with, with, with these girls. Oh, that's yeah, I was going to say, it must be hard to build momentum if you like one girl, but then you have to go date four others. So hard. <laughs> Did you ever forget names or any details about the girls? No, I didn't actually. I was really good. I was really impressed. The first night was chaos. The first night is, you know, we, there was three of, three of us guys and then 30 girls in the mansion and everybody's wanting your attention. And so I swear to God, like I was so nervous. I was like, you know, talking to someone and then someone grabs my arm, go, go to the other person. And then Thomas, can you come over here? Thomas. I was like, wow, <laughs> it was crazy. Um, but towards the end, uh, I got a really good grasp of it. Um, and you know, when is it that you're going to date 10 girls at once again? Mm. So I was really grateful and mindful of this, of, of, the, of the event and just taking it in day by day. You're dating at the moment, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Has that experience dating 10 girls at once? helped improve you dating one girl at once? Has it changed your dating process at all? Uh, I think it's definitely improved it. Yes. I, I, I now, because during the show, you've got 20 minutes to decide if this person is compatible with you or not. And so now even with dating, like the first things I look at is like, are we going to be compatible? And I go straight in with some really good questions. Um, uh, it's, all, it's almost like prospecting, right? Prospecting yeah. for a relationship. Are we going to be good for each other or not? And so I go in with the right intentions and I don't want to waste my time or her time. Mm. Yeah, I'd say so. I guess on the show, there's a, a big expectation for that person to become the one. Mm. People are looking for the one. In sometimes in real world dating, that can be a little bit sabotaging. You kind of just need to work out if they're going to be right for the moment and try not to look too far in advance. Yeah. On the show, you're looking for a wife, but in real life, you're kind of just looking for someone who might be good for the present moment and you can let it evolve as it goes along? Such a good question. And I, I went on this show being somebody who is very uh, grounded and mindful and aware. And I was like, I'm not going to get sucked in uh, the bubble of, of The Bachelor. Because obviously you were in this show for two months, no, no social media, no friends, no nothing. And um, because I wasn't exposed to the external reality, I actually got somewhat hypnotized. And I was thinking, my soulmate is on this show. There's no other, I'm going to, I'm going to walk out here with my soulmate. And so there was a lot of pressure in, in finding that person. And, um, and I just completely forgot that there was another reality outside of it. Mm. And I was thinking of the fairy tale ending of, you know, going to finale, finding the one, eventually proposing, perhaps getting married, having kids. I could just think of that when in reality, now that I look back, but obviously a completely different perspective, um, I, I now see wholeheartedly that my person was not on that show. Right. And so perhaps I should have just walked away doing a honey badger without choosing anyone. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Would that be one of the things you'd change if you could go back? I think so. Mm. Yeah. Do you think the girls 
also got hypnotized by the show. I mean, it'd be hard not to when you're in that bubble. You're being told by the host and I guess all the producers that you're here to find your soulmate. Do you think a lot of them got swept away with that fairy tale as well? I think so. Yeah, totally. And there's lots of, you know, back interviews behind the scenes where they ask you like lots of deep questions and perhaps they've got to play with your emotions a little bit. So yeah, it's a possibility. I'm interested if you found choosing the winner. Did you find that process stressful? Oh my gosh, it was so stressful. So uh, the reality of the situation was that I had chosen someone else towards mid-show. And then because I couldn't really have some sort of commitment or proper interest from, from this person, I got towards the end where I didn't know who to choose. So I got to the morning of finale, 6.30 a.m., where the producers called me and they were like, Thomas, who are you going to choose? And I was like, I've got no idea. The night before, I didn't sleep. Oh, man. I couldn't sleep. I was so stressed. Um, and, and then um, something happened, and I realized that I had these two beautiful women that I could choose from. One was the female version of myself that I was mostly attracted to and mostly aligned with, but I feel that she had a fear of commitment. She never really gave me that certainty that if I chose her, she would have been happy, but we could have worked it together. I didn't feel that, so I was like a bit apprehensive. And on the other side, I had someone who was like ready for it, lots of kids, you know, let's, you know, let's settle in, easy life, committed, always there. And so I just chose the, the second person. Right, yeah. So maybe both girls weren't a complete fit, but you felt that one might be a bit more appropriate. Yes. Now that things haven't worked out with the winner, were you ever tempted to approach the runner-up? Yeah, absolutely. I was very tempted. I did reach out to her a few times and we're still in very, very good terms. Um, who knows? Maybe something will happen in the future. <laughs> you never know. You never know. She's fantastic. How would you like to now use your platform and what messages would you like to share? I've always been really passionate in, in helping people. Um, and um, my story is I used to be a burnt out restaurant manager. I was very disconnected. I was very distracted. And then I went on this journey of connecting my mind, body and spirit. And I found this, this passion in, uh, in helping people do the same. And uh, I would love going forward, I would love to use my platform to inspire people to become the best version of themselves. Um, I do that through uh, coaching. I, I'm, I'm doing that now through writing a couple of books as well. Um, yeah, my mission in life has always been to be that beaming light for people. And I just wanna be able to do more of that. Was there a moment or a turning point in your career as a restaurant manager where you thought, no, this is enough, enough's enough, I need a change? Yes, there was. So uh, back in 2017, I think it was, I was the life of the party. So I would, uh, you know, work 70 hours a week. I would drink wine every night and on the weekend, you know, it was recreational drugs, bender for two days, um, had the best time, would, would never change that because I had the best time. But um, after three years of living that lifestyle, I woke up one morning in my apartment in Modern Junction and I was just so ashamed of who I saw in the mirror. Like I saw the bags under the eyes. I saw the poor muscle. Um, the, I didn't have any muscle. I had this like gut that was not healthy, no energy, no zest for life. Mm. And that was a turning point. My girlfriend at the time gave an ultimatum and she was like, Thomas, if you don't start taking care of yourself, I'm going to find someone else to spend my, the, the rest of my life with. And that was like a big like knife at the heart. And so that morning was the morning when I was like, okay, I'm going to start to do something. And I started with my nutrition, then with my fitness, then with my mindset, with my spirituality. And it's been a journey, as you can imagine. But that was the turning point. I had reached rock bottom that morning. Before The Bachelor, you won a fitness comp called Isobody, yeah. where I believe you stacked on 30 pounds of muscle, won a huge amount of money. Yeah. Was that shortly after your transformation out of the restaurant manager business? Yeah. So I saw the Isobody challenge as a way to improve my body initially. It was a 16 week challenge, um, all about accountability. So there was people like they're supporting you. Uh, it worked really, really well. I ended up doing five eyes and body challenges back to back. So almost what, two years of, um, of me just doing this challenge, which is just becoming the best version of myself. And then I became the champion for Australia in 2019. And then I got flown to America and uh, I became the first ever global champion. Um, and I won $92,000. It's like a house deposit. Yeah. And it's insane. Yeah. Insane. Nuts. Obviously, I still pinch myself because it's just beautiful. But when I look at the photos, it's I did it for myself and I became this best version of myself. But then 
through that, I was, people were asking me, Thomas, what are you doing? You're changing, like, well, your energy is changing. And through that, I found this new passion and zest in helping people. Were there any aha moments or key parts to do with your nutrition or movement that really sort of showed you the light and that you can credit for that transformation? Or was it a series of tiny little steps? I think it was a series of tiny little steps, but um, for the first time ever, I understood the basics, you know, how important nutrition is, dense nutrition in particular, how important sleep is, how important hitting, you know, your water intake. I discovered intermittent fasting for the first time. So I was fasting for longevity purposes, like 24, 36 or 48 hours wow. every week. Yep. And it was such a struggle at the beginning, but then the more I learned about it, the more I was like, holy sugar, like how do people not do this? Like, I want to live longer, I want to live healthier. Mm. And, um, and that was a huge part of my transformation, the, the fasting process. Are you fasting at the moment? Yes, I fast, I fast once a week every Monday, right. usually 24 hours or, or 36 hours. Brilliant. And are you having breakfast at the moment? Do you fast daily or do you just save it for that once a week? Just save it for that once a week, yeah. yeah. So I tend to just have that chunk of time where my, my goal is autophagy. So yeah. it's mostly having like the most autophagy I can during that day. Yeah. Yeah, you seem to be across your nutrition, very specific about the calories you need in to maintain your muscle. Where did this learning come from? Has this been a self-learning process or were you able to get guidance there? I have a coach. So I have um, the most awesome coach called Lockie Horner. He's been following me since 2018. He's a living Wikipedia. Really? Yeah. He, you know, just asks him questions and he just gives you the answer right away. He knows everything. And, and he's the one that introduced me to um, a better way of eating for my body and then teaching me about macros, obviously the protein intake that you need and what to focus on for the results that I, that I wanted. And how often would you do weights, for example, every week? Yeah, so my current routine is uh, four times a week I do strength training, weights, and then twice a week I do something called ice, which it, which means intense cardio exercise, right, not okay, a drug. Okay. <laughs> to say it's a bit of a radical approach, but you're like, <laughs> it's okay, clearly working. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take advice from him, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, which means intense cardio exercise, and because I always loved having a strong body, but always loved being athletic as well. And so ice is an approach where you do. Um, anything you want, treadmill, um, you know, bicycle, 20 minutes. So first four minutes is a pace eight out of 10, and then one minute, 10 out of 10 for four times. And by the end of it, you're absolutely cooked and it works really well. That sounds like something that would be suitable for the rower yes. as well. Always looking for little bursts of movement that I can just slot into my day when I need a little break. Yes. So obviously you've got such good habits in place for your fitness and these other areas of your life, but you're also quite a spiritual person. And I'm curious about how you dance between the rigid structure of having those habits, but then allowing yourself to go with the flow of the universe. Mm. Like, do you find yourself having to dance between those different energies? I, I'm definitely someone that dances a lot between the energies and I love to go with the flow. However, I have realized that I did need some structure. So I'm very, very big on my morning routine and on my night and routine. So those are the two moments where like morning, for example, I set myself up for the day. I, I, I charge my energy. I decide if I want, how I want to show up that day mm. with a series of routines that I have. And then I also realized that the perfect morning routine starts the night time before. And so, um, when I was in a restaurant, for example, I used to go to bed and I used to, you know, watch television or be on my phone in bed and not protect myself from a light. Um, and now I'm very rigid where I don't watch TV two hours before bed usually. I put my blue blocks on. Yep. I light up a candle in the bathroom and that gives, gives me the message to start winding, winding down. Right, yeah. And I have this procedure where um, the night before, I always write up my notepad, my three most important tasks for the day after. So when I wake up, I know exactly what to tackle. Mm. And I usually eat the frog. The, Brilliant. The first first thing I do, the, the most important thing. The most difficult things at the top of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and then the morning after I wake up, I have an intention, I'm on purpose, I charge my energy, I meditate, move a little bit, and then start work. Then start your day. Yeah. So in that morning meditation, is that about setting your intention and your purpose for the day? Yeah. Setting my intention and my purpose for the day and just allowing myself to be in, in, in quietness. Uh, yeah. I, I recently discovered that um, I used to be someone who was always craving that deep meditation that, like, you know, almost like journeying in the void because I've been there a few times. 
And when I couldn't do that, I would make myself wrong. But I recently discovered that the sit, the meditation is just the sit. So whatever happens, happens, you know, don't be the judge of thoughts, just allow thoughts to come in, to come, to, to, to come and go. Yep. Um, and if one day my mind is an absolute mess, so to speak, that's okay. That's okay. And if one day I'm in the void, fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Bonus. I think that's what puts a lot of people off meditation starting out because their brain is so still active mm. and they think, oh, I can't do it. I'm not doing meditation. It's not for me. So they give up. But my advice to them is just, just stay with it. Most days it will be busy and it'll be a process to quieten the mind and that's going to take some time. Yeah. Don't judge yourself if your mind is a little bit active. Yeah. What about if you're in a relationship, do you find it hard to, probably talking from experience here, but sometimes when you're merging lives with someone, it might be difficult to maintain the really good night routine, the really good morning routine. Have you found you've had to make compromises there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hit us, hit us all spot. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 I absolutely, even just recently, um, yeah, through, through dating, uh, I realized that, you know, I've, I've been single for quite a, for two years now. So my routines are like set in stone. And recently I was, uh, dating a girl and, um, obviously, you know, nighttime routine goes out of the window. The morning routine goes out of the window yeah, and yeah. then I just have to find pockets in my morning where I can just sit for 20 minutes and, uh, and, and do the most, well, obviously meditate, um, be in control of my state and then do the most important things. Mm. But yes, definitely, uh, not easy. Have to adjust. Adjustment. Yeah. And again, just be compassionate. Don't beat yourself up. You've got to realize that that connection piece is just as important as the mindfulness piece. Yeah. So it's not always going to be perfect. Just do the best you can and yeah. enjoy merging that life. Yeah. What's your type? What sort of girl are you trying to attract into your life? For me, what's important is having someone who has similar values to me. So somebody who really values their health and wellness, uh, somebody who values their exercise and fitness, because obviously if she doesn't, then we're not going to be compatible in the long run. Um, someone who is driven and has purpose in life and, you know, is, has, is, is out there to create some magic. I'm really attracted to that because I'm, I'm the same. Um, and essentially having same values and then just finding a best friend who I can align with. Mm. And obviously we can go and create some absolute incredible magic in, in the world. Is mindfulness meditation, is that an essential thing that you're looking for in a partner or you don't need that? Um, I don't, I don't think it's essential. Um, I have been, I have, I've met some incredible women and I've got some incredible friends who are very mindful, but don't meditate. Yeah. And, uh, and just being in their presence and their aura is very refreshing and very charging. So I don't think that is uh, a deal breaker as long as I'm with somebody who, um, has self-love and, uh, who is connected. That's, that's what I, that's what I crave. Mm, yeah. And you're right. You can get that through yoga, yeah. even going from walks to just someone who is connected with their body. I think yeah. drive for me is a big one as well. Yeah. I think there's nothing more attractive than when a girl just has a drive to get after it and a passion to explore life and is curious about life. Yeah. Probably the biggest one for me. Yeah. We actually share a, the same coach, Leonard, and I'm, I'm curious about any lessons that you've taken away from those sessions with him? Yeah, uh, it's so interesting. I love Leonard so much. He, as I said, as you said, a wizard. It's just been incredible. I was craving growth in my sp spirit, some spiritual growth. And obviously in order to grow, I love to align myself with people who know more than me. Um, and as of now, I have learned so much. Leonard has, has taught me a lot about perspective. Um, he has taught me a lot uh, about being more centered and more connected. And the biggest lesson I've had so far is that situations will happen in your life. And obviously the way that you react to such situations will say a lot about yourself. Leonard has taught me to be the observer. So when I, when I, when, whenever something happens, don't react right away, almost like take a step back, observe, don't judge. Um, and it's almost like saying, this might be a little bit controversial, but life is empty and meaningless. And people might say, what do you mean? Life is so meaningful. But when you think about it, life has only the meaning that you give to it. Mm. And so in any situation that you go in, people will attach meaning to things, to arguments, to 
you know, somebody may be pipping their horn at you in traffic, but I just love to think, you know, isn't that interesting? And then I just take a step back, observe, then judge, and then I act accordingly. And that, that has given me so much peace um, because I understand that it's, I, I can just take a step back and not give it any meaning. Yeah. You that makes the, sense. Absolutely. You have the power to assign your emotions, create space between the stimulus and your reaction and choose a more productive outcome. Yeah. A big one that I learned as well, I think was the first lesson. I was always quite aware of beta, alpha, theta, brain waves, but obviously he breaks it down and he teaches you, you know, most people will leave it, will live in a beta state where they are attracting, um, anxious thoughts, uh, depression thoughts, uh, fight or flight mode. Mm. And so you're constantly reacting to what's around you. Um, and then he teaches you how do you, how you can then go into alpha state where, which is the flow state, which is you can attract joy and abundance and love. And when you see the different states, you think to, you think to yourself, okay, like obviously I've been living in beta for quite a while. To go in alpha, I just need to be a little bit more mindful, perhaps meditate, perhaps find some mindfulness moments in my day. But most people don't want to do that second step and are just attracting those negative feelings in beta. Mm. And when you see them, you're like, if I want to be a more connected human and if I want to, if I want to love more, if I want to have more success, better performance, it makes sense to go into alpha. Yeah. And so that was a huge takeaway for me. Yeah. I knew it, but seeing it, I was like, okay, this is just absolutely mind blowing. It's wild. Yeah. And it's so cool when those opportunities start coming in as well. Yeah. It's no, it's no coincidence that when you do work in those mindful moments throughout the day and you're in more of a receiving mindset, that's when the opportunities start to flow. Yes. Like, oh yeah, this, this is adding up. Yes. And it goes back to what we were saying about you creating space in the morning to just sit. Yes. I think the tendency is, and I'm guilty of this as well, is you just want to run out the door grab your coffee, start your day. Yes. But essentially that's putting a bandaid on things. Yeah. You just need to connect with yourself and then that's the best platform for you to get out there. Totally. And get after it. Cause like, you know, we always end up charging our phone before bed at nighttime because we could never wake up with our phone on 1% battery. But if we don't give that our time, we give ourselves time to actually show up in a certain way during the day, it's almost like not charging our phone. Yeah. Like we, yeah, it's so important. You strike me as such a confident person who's living in alignment and you're so aligned with, and with your purpose and what you want to do. Are there any doubts or limiting beliefs that come up as a pattern for you that you have to work through? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I have, uh, have quite a few limiting beliefs. There was one in particular that I'm still probably battling with is the fear of being judged. Um, and that's why this show helped me a lot because I was judged by the whole country. Mm. Um, but that is something that I had since childhood and still today, like it, it comes up, it goes and I just recognize it. Mm. Um, I think every day, like I am questioning myself, I think as humans we do, but that's even more so why I have my practices in place. I used to be very anxious. I used to, you know, stress a lot. I used to stutter when I was younger. And so I've set these procedures in place so that I can ensure to show up in more confidence with more certainty during the day. And it's funny because like the moments when I actually slip away from my practices, then anxiety pips up, fear of judgment creeps up. I start to not be as aligned as I am. And I really realize how important those practices are. For anyone listening that might be experiencing fear of judgment themselves, do you have any advice on a very specific or particular technique that helps you process that? Yeah. So my favorite so far, which has helped me heaps is affirmations. So I will have a set of cards, which I read out every, every morning, or every nighttime or whenever really I need them. And based on the fear that I have, I just, um, turn around, turn, turn it around on the affirmation and just read it out loud and feel it when I'm, when I'm, when I'm saying it, and I ensure that that is serving me in that moment. So for example, when I used to stutter, um, I used to start out in English and in Italian. And so one affirmation was, I'm a confident speaker in both English and Italian. Right. Um, I'm the kind of energy that lights up a room when I walk into a room. Uh, I'm confident, I'm powerful, I'm strong, I'm love, I'm magnetic. Um, and it sounds really woo-woo. It probably was for me when I first heard it, but I believe it now. So, it and yeah. when I believe it, you're not, you're absolutely right. And so yeah. Yeah. that's been something that has really helped me, affirmations. Very cool, man. Yeah. I think the key post part of that is feeling it, allowing right. your body to step into it and experience that. Yeah. And I guess that's similar for manifesting as well. 
I know you're a manifester. Can you take me through your process? Yes, manifesting is is huge. Are you are you big on it too? Yeah, yeah. Um, my process in manifesting is quite simple. Whenever I find that I really want to create something in my life, I need to get really clear with with why, and I got to paint a picture of how my life will look like once I achieve that. So, for example, in in business or with the As a Body Challenge, for example. I took some time out, I went to the beach, I was journaling, I was seeing myself winning. And the question that I asked myself on the piece of paper was, what would the Eyes of Body Challenge win and do? And so every single day, whenever I was put in front of situations um, or decisions, I would only act if the answer was gonna, give, was, gonna serve, was gonna serve me in terms of how I would show up as an Eyes of Body Challenge winner. Right. And I would see myself winning. I, w- I would act a certain way every single day. And then when I, when I went to the actual challenge, I had already seen it all happening. And so I went in it as the Eyes of Body Challenge winner. I went in the interview acting like the Eyes of Body Challenge winner. We're not being cocky. Lots of, I was really humble, yeah. but that's how you got to do it. So you got to act as if you're ready. it. It's already happening and you have to have seen it already. And that's what happened. I, I, was, I was there, I knew what was gonna happen. And then all of a sudden I heard conversations that uh, validated the fact that I was gonna win. And then I won. Amazing. Yeah. Because you felt deserving of it on a subconscious level. Yeah. Your subconscious was like, been there, done that. I feel comfortable here. Yeah. It reminds me of an audition. I've used that in an audition environment where imagining the room, imagining everyone in that room receiving the audition really well. And then imagining you walking out of the room with a huge smile on your face thinking, yep, that went fucking well. That visualization manifestation is just incredibly it's incredible. powerful. Yeah. So to answer your question, like I have a day or moment where I just really focus on seeing it, seeing it happening. I write it down. I feel it. And then every morning before or during my meditation, I visualize that. Um, that event to visualize whatever it is that I want to manifest. Could it be a relationship? It could be, you know, business. It could be anything, really. Cool. Yeah. Simple. 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 We like simple. Yeah. Simple's good. Now, you mentioned that there's an Italian accent there as well. Yes. You grew up in Tuscany, in Italy, a place that I fucking adore. What sort of impact do you think growing up in the Italian countryside had on the person you are today? Oh, I think huge, um, huge. Like in terms of traditions and in terms of culture, it has taught me a lot. I grew up in the countryside uh, in a farm and, um, you know, from the age of, from my little boy till 16, my chores were muck out the, uh, the, the cows and the horses and the pigs and go and pick up, then I'll pick the vegetables, chop the wood in, in the winter. I had the time, I remember I used to hate it because my friends were all like playing outside with their scooters or, you know, playing football and stuff. And I had to like work. <laughs> but looking back now, I'm so grateful because it has, it has taught me so much. And um, it really has allowed me to blossom, I guess, in, in somebody who can do many different things. Mm. Um, and in Italy, we are very big on, on culture. We are very big on family. We are very big on sharing these beautiful moments together. And that is something that will definitely carry with me for the rest of my life. Brilliant. Will you stay in Australia, do you think, for the rest of your life? I think life? so. Yeah. I like Australia, but I'm also someone that if you tell me, hey, Thomas, there's this awesome opportunity in LA where we can, you know, go out and absolutely crush it. I mean, if, I, if I'm aligned with it, I'm like, sure, let's go. Would you like to be a dad? Would you like to create a family and settle down a little bit like that? Well, I don't like the term settle down because I don't think we need to compromise on any of our dreams yeah. or anything when that comes in. But is that something you'd like to create in the I've been exploring this question the past the past couple of years, and I think at the moment I don't really see myself as a dad. Um, mostly being the first another another partner, mm. uh, and I don't really I, I I have not seen that reality. I yeah. don't mean manifesting it, or visualizing it, right? Yeah. Um, but um, but I do think that if I when I do find my ideal partner, if if that is something that is important to her, I would absolutely love to, um, yeah, create uh, a human. Together. A human Experience. baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brilliant. Next stage of life. What about those those dating experiences from your perspective? Do you, are you, you don't strike me as someone who plays games at all. How important is it to, for people to show up as themselves and just be honest and present in those datings? So important. I think communication is so key. And yeah, and just really, really being yourself and 
um, going in, going in a, in a day knowing that you're not there to to waste time and just really being your authentic self is so important. And um, I don't know about you, but dating these days is I I have got this like love and hate relationship where I'm on the apps. I, I, I don't like them. Like I, I almost, I, I just don't vibe with them. I have them on because I still think that the unicorn will probably one day come. Yeah. And I'm really hoping so. Um, but, um, yeah, I'm definitely more of a, more of a believer of, um, meeting someone organically at a social event. Mm. I remember with Zoe, who you're yet to meet. So I deleted Raya, deleted Hinge as I was leaving that first date. And it's not because I expected us to be, uh, exclusive or anything because I wanted to send her a signal that I was focused and and reliable, but also just to send the universe a message that I was ready and I wanted something better. I think with dating, people can have a tendency to want to play games, treat people mean to keep them keen and show them that they're, they're looking at a few different options. Yeah. But in my experience, that isn't very attractive and I think that attracts people who are carrying wounds of their own because you're attracting people at that level. Yeah. I think there's nothing more attractive when someone is secure and has that secure attachment style. They can say, yep, I'm into this. I'm not looking at anyone else. I'm present. Might not go anywhere, but I'm going to give this my focus and attention. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. I think after this, you've inspired me. I might just go and delete my, my apps. You trust the universe. Yeah, you trust the universe. Yeah. Send a message, a clear message. Well, and you've also got Instagram. I'm sure you'd get a few DMs that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and somebody, somebody once told me, um, everybody is very lowly and I'm just simply looking for the, someone else to make the first move. Mm. And so that's usually how I, like people often wanted to make their first move, but they don't. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. And then it's easier for them to find a new match than it is to say hello. So they're constantly just expanding their matches yes. Yes. and you, no one gets anywhere. Yes, exactly. They exactly. pretty slow detecting. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think we just addressed this, but at the moment, are you actively seeking someone or are you more just sitting back and allowing someone to come into your life? Um, I am. I'm right in between. I, I'm not going to lie, like the thought of finding someone is very much on my mind right now. So I, I would, I would, I really want to attract that someone. Um, and at the same time, I'm also trusting the universe that the person will come. However, after having a session with Mr. Wolf, uh, he taught me something and he was like, you got to make sure that you are, you know, exactly what you want mm -hmm. and that you're vibrating at the same level that you want this person to come into your life because obviously your vibe attracts your tribe. Um, and that made me think that a few behaviors that I was having were confusing the universe. Because it's like, yeah, he wants this girl that is behaving. He, he wants to get out of this vibration, but he's behaving in a lower vibration. And so this girl won't even notice him. Mm, there's another line right now. And so that was a huge thing for me. And so right now I'm really focusing on vibrating at the same level, be the person that I want to attract. Yeah. And, uh, and see what happens. That's super powerful. I completely agree with that. And I think that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get off the apps because I didn't want to send the universe messages that my attention was scattered everywhere. I was like, I'm ready for something. So might not be this person, but this is the frequency I want to put out there. Yeah. So man, I'm curious to, to know, you do such an amazing job on social media with your content. It's very inspiring. And I really admire your consistency. Where would you like to take your work with your social media? And you mentioned you were writing a book. Thank you. Yeah. So at the moment, most of my energy is going towards finishing my, my book. Um, my book is called Connected. And it, it, I guess it tells a story of how I used to be very burnt out and distracted and how I used to use alcohol and drugs to fill that void. Uh, and when I'm, I'm writing it, I see in mind, I have the vision of the person that I used to be, I want to help him. Um, and so where I want to take this going forward is obviously having this book published and really helping people connect their mind, body and spirit. And then I would really love to um, go around the country and just maybe have talks at schools or speak on stages and just really help people with their mental health, with their health. I'm no guru, I'm no expert. I'm just somebody who has the passion in, in helping others and I've done the work. And, that's what I would love to do, just constantly helping people. With the book, has that been a process of discovery, working out, I mean, just writing a book in the first place, but working out how to deal with editors or publishers? It's been crazy. So 
lots of work in, in developing it, obviously. And then the funny thing is that I got so sick of it because I was reading it every single day and I was like, it's shit. I don't like it anymore. And so I needed to have a new set of eyes on it. So now I'm, I'm working with the editor. She's helping me and she's fantastic. Give them a bit more flow. I help her with some grammar mistakes because I did heaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> You're right, yeah. We're on a reel. And then publishers. So my agency has been pitching it to publishers and and I've been rejected so many times because um publishers still see me as Thomas the Bachelor and there's a bit of a disconnect in between um who I want to be versus who I what I, who I was, like what in the show. And so right now I'm just I really want to change that narrative and then um yeah, how publishers see the real me, the my real passion. Yeah, cool, man. And I, th- I think that's why I felt a bit funny about opening with The Bachelor stuff because I don't see you as The Bachelor. I see you for all of these wonderful things that we align on that we've yeah. that we've chatted about. Have you found it difficult changing public perception? Ever so slightly within myself because um, when, I I uh, when I finished The Bachelor, I was pulled left, front and centre, you know, modelling and do content and work with brands. And so that was very well received. But it wasn't aligned to the core. It really was like I love modern, I love fashion. But for me, if I'm not actively having an impact on people in a positive way, in a constructive way, that I don't feel fulfilled. Yeah. And so I felt as if my content wasn't congruent with where it was. Mm. Now that I've changed that, I'm having a little bit less of a um, reaction from my socials because most of my people follow me from the bachelor. Yeah. And so it's, I guess, a bit hard on the ego. But I feel aligned in my soul. That's important. Yeah. Right. And so I think that if I keep going this way, I'm going to attract the people who are interested in that content. I believe that. Be- I agree completely. Yeah. Just might take a little bit of a transition period. I relate. Um, yeah, being on a show, I've, I, I knew what used to land well with the audience and that was either stuff about the show or maybe more model pics or pics without your shirt on. Yeah. And while that might feel good, good for engagement, Ultimately, that's not the stuff that's going to fulfill you. So I'm very much the same. Yeah, it doesn't really matter if it's not going to be received as well because I genuinely think you're putting more value out into the universe yeah. and ultimately that will be reflected. Yeah, and your content is so good as well. I, I was so inspired by your, your skits. Oh, thank so you, man. Funny. Yeah, I just got to uh, find the time to, to keep pumping them out. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, I just got to let it, let it flow, but it is good fun. Yeah. And how lucky are we that we get to create stuff and just play as yeah. a job. Can I ask you a question, like, you know, once you've put so much effort into creating a skit and, and a time and, and thought, like when you, when you press that upload button, like how do you feel? If, it's a, if I'm proud of it, I'm really excited for people to receive it. To, I don't really value the skit based on the reaction because the engagement of the reel doesn't always equal the, the quality in my opinion. Sure. If I do one where I feel like, you know, I've done a good accent or the writing's clever. That's enough to fulfill me regardless of how well it's received. And it's funny, sometimes I'll put the exact same skit on TikTok and Instagram. Instagram might be 2 million, TikTok might be 2,000. So that's just a, that's an indication of how things can just get taken by the algorithm. So you've got to remain a little bit impartial to that. So with the book, you mentioned there's a second book in the works and that's more around biohacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of biohacking, all the things we've mentioned, manifesting, meditation, all of those things, are you, do you dabble in supplement world as well? Yes. Yes. I am massive on supplements. Like I take so many supplements during the day and that's all a part of biohacking as well. So essentially what I love the most about biohacking is that we're not all the same. You know, what works for you, Mick, might not work for me. Um, you know, you might be vegan and might have the most incredible results to me in mind that might not work. And so biohacking is an approach where you just self-experiment on yourself and then you find what works best for you. Supplements, I take heaps, you know, um, I, I'm really big on uh, collagen. I'm really big on eutropics and NADs. Yep. And obviously when I fast, I also take a supercharged tea that helps me relieve toxins even faster, you know, more efficiently, um, protein shakes to get extra protein and, you know, um, digestive enzymes in. Mm. Yeah, I, 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 I know that unfortunately, um, we don't have the same amount of nutrition in food these days as we used to 30 years ago. Yeah. And so I'm going to be smart with the way I show up in life and supplements have been crucial. Yeah, great. And you mentioned a few there. Are there any others that have been, have had a massive impact on you? Uh, the biggest ones are, I definitely say implementing, uh, I eat a lot, but implementing um, 
meal replacement shakes has helped me heaps. Okay. Like getting all those micronutrients in has really helped me with my energy. Collagen has been huge. Really? And what will you take that in the morning? In the morning. Yeah. yeah. I take liquid collagen though. So uh, your body absorbs it faster. Right. And I actually turn 51 tomorrow. Do you really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, someone asked, Zoe asked me how old you were. And I've, I always said, I reckon he's probably 38. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that, man. That's, I mean, that's a testament to all the wonderful things you're doing. Yeah. So that's I did a 37 in November. Oh, you do? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> you got me so good. <laughs> so I was right. <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> oh, damn it. Um, but yeah, collagen has been a big one. Um, creatine after my workouts. I've yeah. had a workout. It wears out. That's a powder. It's a powder. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, recently, NAB, um, NAB capsules have really helped. Um, I've used this before. Yeah. So yeah. will you have that in the morning as well? I have those in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Two tablets in the morning, and it just really helped you with uh, cell and cellular health. Yeah. Uh, energy, mitochondria function. So many beautiful things. It's like that. Uh, it, it's almost like taking a cheat code for life. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Help you with uncaging as well. Have you read David Sinclair's book, Lifespan? Lifestyle. I uh, oh. did, did this inspire some of your longevity supplements? Yeah, heaps. So, you know, funny story. I read that and then I read Brain Health. And then I read, um, before those, I read uh, Robin Sharma, the 5 a.m. club. Robin Sharma is all about optimizing your performance and keeping you know, a little tip to what to do each morning, each night time to be a more purposeful individual. And I was like, now that I've learned this information, it's impossible to unlearn. I have to, I want to, I want to implement it in my life, but also want to teach it. Have you had any luck implementing the actual 5 a.m. wake up time? I know it's winter, we're sleeping in a little bit, but is that something that you would like to move towards? I would love to move to the 5 a.m. Uh, wake up. And then my birthday, I'm at 7 a.m. Um, I would love to. I just, I just, I just haven't found it. It's hard. The motivation, I guess. Is your mind, do you like writing things and creating at that time of the day? Yeah, so in the, in the morning, uh, I find myself being the most creative. I love, I'm very switched on, so I love to meditate and exercise and then put my energy into writing and creating. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, 5 a.m. would have to be like a whole other level of being organized. Yeah. Um, and obviously, it's, it's a habit too, so I have to give myself maybe like 60 days to implement it. Mm. And then it ties in again into your partner. So when I do find a partner, she's going to have to be on board, I think. Yeah. A lot of ways. She might want to have some sexy time at 10, 8, 10 p.m. I'm like, hey, I'm waiting up. <laughs> yeah. Just show her the book. <laughs> yeah. Fire Hand Club, baby. Well, mate, thank you for coming on. I, I get the sense that we will have lots more of these chats. But before I let you go, one question I ask every guest is, who are you becoming? So who is a version of Thomas that you are trying to step into every day? Love this question so much. Um, and um, who are we coming? I, I, I'd like to answer this question in terms of I am shedding now parts of myself that are not serving me anymore um, that have been such a huge part of my identity in the last 30 years of my life. And so I am now becoming the most authentic and aligned version of myself, somebody that can actually stand in my own um, authenticity and impact people in a really positive way. Um, so being more and more aligned with who I am at the core and uh, being more and more and more unapologetically me. It's beautiful, mate. Thomas Malucelli, thanks, for, th <laughs> thanks for coming on. There you go. That's it. Side note, prego is my favorite Italian word. Is it? I just use it completely out of context every time I go to Italy. It's the prego. best. Prego. <laughs> They're like, hey, how are you? Prego. <laughs> prego. I don't, right. Awesome, man. That was, that was fun.